Okay, any questions, board members? I, uh, Director London. Mr. Bennett, it's always so great to have you with us. Thank you. I, I can't tell you the number of times I have repeated what I learned from you on my very first day of school board training, which mm -hmm. is that, and now it's somewhat irrelevant, but if someone had, you know, sat down and tried to come up with a more complicated system of how to fund public education, they couldn't under the old formula. So thank you for that, because I've quoted you so many times your ears must burn constantly. Right. Um, but my question, I mean, this is all great. My question is, to, you made a point about we'll still be 46th in the nation in 2021. I'm very interested in figuring out how we can move the dial in Sacramento around adequately funding education and funding at least at the national average per pupil. And, um, and one last thing, because I, I really do want to hear it, but I think part of the problem is that when people look at the overall state budget and they see that you know about 50% is already going to education, well, they're already getting 50%. Why do they need more? And so it seems like we haven't done, as the education community, a good enough job of making the case about why per pupil funding is what's really important and not the amount you spend in the overall budget. So um, those are all really good points, and let me just address a couple of them. Uh, why does such a high percentage of the state budget go into education, but we end up with so little per student? It's because when we compare with other states, in most states, the education budget does not go through the state. Most of the dollars are locally generated and go directly to schools. That's what happened in California prior to 1971. In 1971, we had the Serrano decisions where the state was supposed to equalize funding because by using just property taxes like a lot of other states do, we had high wealth districts and low wealth districts, sometimes right next door to each other. And so a court ruled the state had to step in and equalize the funding. So now the money gets washed through the state um, and even this formula equalizes the base funding and then provides a supplement for students who qualify. And the court said that was legal to do and, that, and that's what the state has done. So, um, but your, the broader question and the better question that you asked is, you know, why doesn't California have competitive per student funding? I mean, look at the facts. We are a high tax state. We collect a lot of taxes. Um, when you look at the major categories of expenditure for the state of California and compare those expenditures on an apples to apples basis with other states in the nation, we spend higher than the national average in every single area except one, and that's education. Hmm. And we are far below the national average. We used to be down on uh, transportation as well. And then the voters passed Prop 42 a few years ago. Transportation now exceeds the national average. But education still doesn't. And so we have, a, uh, we have two problems with public education funding. Uh, one is the level of funding, and the second is the lip service that's given to the policies about that funding. And so uh, California can do better, should do better. Um, if, if I were to look at California and do a budget analysis like I would do on your district, I'd look at the way they spend their money and I would say, okay, where is California spending more than the rest of the nation? And there are a couple of areas and you would see them instantly. I mean, I'd be looking at, if you're spending less on education, what are you spending more on as a percentage of your budget? Yeah. And what I would find is there are two major areas, uh, welfare and prisons. Well, you know, uh, I was on a, a radio program over in, Sac in San Francisco a couple of years ago, and it was late at night, and it was a call-in show. And you can get some fairly strange questions on a late night call-in show. And um, I'm talking, there's a county soup on with me, and we're talking about public education. And a caller says, what are you guys doing about prisons? Prisons are sucking up all the money. And uh, it, until we solve the prisons, there won't be any money for education. And so I figure the announcer uh, is gonna say, well, uh, that's a topic for another night. But that's not what he did. He said, yeah, Ron, what are you guys doing about prisons? And I said, well, let, let me just be very candid. 
I don't know a lot about prisons, but when I went through school in California, and we were in the top five in per student funding in the nation every single year, um, our prison populations and the cost of serving that population was below the national average. And during the 30 years it took us to go from first to worst in public education, we went from below the national average in prison expenditures to number three in the nation and rising. And so when I look at those two things, it tells me that the way that you solve your prison cost is you fully fund public education and you give our children some options that do not lead to prison, okay? And so, um, on a late night radio station, that was the best I could do. But, but I, think that that's, I think that's all accurate. And, and so if we want our state to do better for our children and to prosper in the future, we have to invest in education. I said this is an exercise in democracy, this local control funding formula. We cannot have democracy with a population that is poorly educated and ill-informed and not able to make the right choices, right? Uh, that's how we end up letting other people make choices for us. And and, and taking us down a road that maybe we wouldn't go if, if we knew more about it. So public education is a, a cornerstone. Uh, when I was a squadron commander in the military, the people that were in my squadron were all through public education, and that was our common bond, and um, that was the place that we started, that's the place that we finished, and our knowledge of democracy and what we were doing. And I think that you have a chance now to emphasize that again. In the past, I would say for the past 30 years, this board has been administering state programs. Take the money, follow the rules, get audited. If you didn't comply, get penalized. Now you have a situation where you make the plan, you get the money, uh, the plan addresses the needs that you see for your students. Uh, you look at the outcomes. You decide if you want to reorient the money. And I think you have a, a real opportunity. Now, you, you have an opportunity that's still at 46th in the nation. So you don't have a lot of money to work with but you have a lot more policy to work with. Okay. I know that was a long answer, but that was a, that was a really good question. Okay, Madam Vice President. Thank you so much for being here and your um, candidness and, and just your long-term service um, on behalf of young people in the state of California. Thank you. So, um, a couple of things I wanted, um, if you wouldn't mind doing deeper analysis and helping me get it a little bit better, and that's the RBB conversation. Um, just so you know, we have created a task force, and so we're beginning to kind of look at that. It, it, RBB was called out early on in the strategic plan that it was something that we really needed to look at. In my particular district, where it's high poverty, really poor education for a number of decades now, um, RBB is, has, it, it's been, people love it and people hate it. Sometimes people are not feeling as though they're actually having enough resources um, they're spending a lot of money on salaries. Um, you know, some things are not centralized anymore. So it, it definitely has been a mixed bag for our district. And yes, we're about to look at that. So I wanted you to, if, if, if you could actually say what it is that you think that we're looking at, because you said we could potentially, I, th I think elements of this was how do you use the money to spread across district and where do you decide to put it down into a school site? And then my second question is around um, charter schools because this is a, applicable to charters as well and this is maybe just a, more of an opinion or a projection on your part around whether or not we might see um, the, the charter schools benefit in, at, at a higher degree because I mean obviously they sit outside the egg code right now and with potentially more resources you know, are we going to need to kind of look at the fact that that might give them a greater edge around competition at this particular point? Um, and so th those are my just. So, so let's hit the charter school question first. Uh, charter schools also get more this year. Um, they get uh, the LCFF funding formula, the local control funding formula. They can't get more per student than you get. So that's one of the limitations. Um, and many of the charter schools, not all, but many of them have, um, for one reason or another, fewer, a lower percentage of students who qualify as either English language learners, free and reduced, or foster children. And so that would give you an advantage um, in terms of, of the percentages where you, you would actually get a chance to catch up and you would get more money than, than they get. 
And uh, in the past, that has not been true. So you could have all of the high needs kids and they could get the same funding that you got. So, um, and I know you have a lot of district sponsored charters. And uh, so I'm not treating this as a, as a good guys, bad guys argument. I'm just saying that a lot of the charters end up with fewer qualifying students and you will now have a little bit of a competitive advantage as a district that you did not have before. On, on the RBB, uh, let me just start out with how everybody else does it. So the, most of the districts in the state uh, provide an elementary school with a fixed sum of money. And it might be $50 per student or $75 per student uh, for materials and other things. They provide a middle school student with a little more. Uh, for a high school student, it might be $200 that they get uh, per student. And the rest of the money stays in the district coffers until the board decides what to do with it. So if I'm a bargaining unit and I'm in uh, one of those other districts, and this describes most of the districts in the state, I come to the bargaining table and I say, you got an extra $10 million this year, and I want to bargain for some of it for my bargaining unit. Um, I have worked on your fact findings when you haven't reached agreement with your bargaining units. And in one of them, it, it was pretty clear that um, the bargaining unit's argument was under RBB, the money's going to go to the school site. You will get $10 million. Uh, you believe in decentralized budgeting. Most of the money will go to the school sites. And when I come to the table, you will say, I no longer have the $10 million. Right? I'm just making up numbers, the $10 million. And so if I'm in one of your neighboring districts, until the board decides to give the school site more money, they get this little pittance per student for instructional materials and things like that. But the big dollars stay at the board level. And then you do your, I picked on collective bargaining because that's a big user of new dollars and we want to have our professional teachers well rewarded. Uh, we want to have high quality teachers. We want good staff development. We want them to remain with us. We want to be able to attract and retain the best. Oakland um, 10 years ago wasn't able to do that and now maybe you'll get a, a little bit of an edge on that. So, so with the RBB what happens is the money goes to the sites and the sites under decentralized management make a lot of the decisions. Um, under the standard model for the rest of the state, most of the money stays at the district till the district decides to give it to the sites. So the district might say, this year what we're going to do is we're going to lower class sizes by two students. So we're going to use our $10 million to do that. And what we're going to do is give each site more teachers. But, we're, but the payroll is centralized. So that would happen at the district level. Um, if we give the money to the district, to the schools, the school sites can't negotiate a pay raise. And so what happens? Now the money's out there and one school hires more teachers, another one buys technology. They, they do what they think is appropriate for their, for their school. Now, for the last five years when you haven't had any money, RBB really didn't matter much because nobody had any money anyway. But now as the money is starting to, to come up, and you're starting to get more money, um, I think you have a policy decision to make. It will manifest itself in your local control accountability plan about who you want to make the decisions about various categories of money. I said that the money has to follow the students who generate it, um, but in your district, my answer would be different in a 10% district. If you only had 10%, I'd say you got to provide supplemental services to those kids, right? Those 10%. But in your district, it's basically all schools. So uh, I hope that was responsive, and I know it was a long answer, but, but when you look at the RBB, what I'd be looking at is uh, what is the appropriate degree of decentralized control? That is the broad question. And I know when the RBB went in, it was because there was mystery and superstition about how this school got so much more money than that school. And so it served a good purpose to at least um, take the mystery out of it and do some equalizing over a long period of time now. Uh, but this new state formula, I, I think, causes you to rethink it. Any other questions? Um, I just had a, a couple of quick ones. Um, just, just to be clear, 
the expenditure of LCFF dollars this year requires an LCAP? So um, this is a transition year, and you are, you are able to spend the dollars this year. Um, your first LCAP is for 13, uh, is for 1415. Okay. Uh, the guidance will be out in the spring on the timeline I gave you. Mm -hmm. So this year you don't, do not have to adopt uh, the formal LCAP for this year, but you, you do for uh, next year. Right. So uh, it is a transition year. Um, is there any guidance from the state, uh, any anticipated guidance from the state for how districts use this year's money? So that was the question that was asked of the state board. Uh, in the absence of state guidance, in the absence of a local control accountability plan, uh, in the absence of the state board's regulations, what are we as a board to do? And the state board gave an answer that I don't think you'd find very satisfactory, but the answer was, we think the law is clear, follow the law. Well, the law is not clear. Right. And so in a couple of weeks, we'll have a, a workshop with 160 slides that shows all of the areas where the law is not clear. And, and, and we'll make recommendations, but those recommendations, some of them uh, we know for sure what the law is. Some of them we're not so sure, and some of them we don't have a clue. And so we're going to divide them into those categories and say, if you get over here where nobody has a clue yet, and you do something out in this area, you could get stung later. And so we're going to do kind of risk assessments on some of these some of these areas for you. And so your recommendation to school districts, and in particular to Oakland, is uh, for this fiscal year, mm -hmm. uh, until there's some, some clarity from the state sometime in January, try to hang on to as much of your money as possible. So um, Extra, uh, in, the, in, in, in the short version, I get to where you are, but I get there a little bit differently. Um, it will be too late by the state, the time the state comes out with its rules for you to do much with the program for this year, because right. you'll be three-fourths of the way school, through the school year. Right. But it's pretty much too late now. You've staffed for the school year. Right. Uh, you've got your classes going. I mean, you're, you're underway. So at the end of uh, March, when you get the guidance, um, the money will be sitting there in the reserve, and if you decide you want to spend it on um, employee compensation, well, you do a retro. If you decide that you're going to use it to get rid of your deficit spending and the structural deficit in your budget, right. you've still got it to do that with if the board decides to do that. Right. If you decide that you want to enhance next year's program with that money, You've got it to do that, and it's ongoing money, so you get another dose of it next year, of this year's money, and some more for next year. And so, so I think that um, in a transition year, you're always looking at the risk of, of doing something, and uh, I don't think you can affect program much at this point, just because of the calendar right. uh, for this year. So holding on to the money, making a decision in the spring uh, as to what you're gonna do with it, I think is the safe bet for this year. And then the, the last question is that then look uh, build for a district to build towards the LCAP adoption, right? So the, the public uh, display of it in the two public hearings. Um, and, and districts are not going to know what the, what's to be included in the LCAP until April 1st, March 31st. Well, we've got about nine areas. Uh, that are laid out in the law right. that the LCAP has to cover. Uh, the details of how you cover them um, and what your options are may not be known, but I think you could start the dialogue right now in all nine areas. Okay, and so you would recommend that, that um, at, at sort of what scope and scale would you recommend that, that dialogue in a district like Oakland? So I would start with, uh, with dialogue among board members about those nine criteria and about how does the superintendent, when I look at the governance team, I think of the governance team as the board and the superintendent. And when the governance team is on the same page, it's a lot easier to move forward. And so I'd spend some time, or even if you know you're on different pages, you, you don't all have to agree, but you at least need to know where you are right. and, and what the majority of the board position is gonna be. And so, so I think spending time with the board 
uh, going over those criteria in that plan and saying, you know, what do you see as the highest priority for our district? What is the superintendent going to recommend? Remember, the board approves, but the superintendent recommends. So the superintendent then uh, needs to hear a little bit from the board and then start talking to the cabinet. So the cabinet talks about what is possible. The board talks about what is desirable. And somewhere, the superintendent ends up in that sandwich, right? right. As to what's possible and what the board wants. And um, so, uh, so, so starting that discussion with the superintendent as the fulcrum, facilitating a board discussion and a cabinet discussion, and that cabinet discussion needs to be expanded. And then your next group is your employee organizations. Um, you cannot make a difference in education for students in Oakland without the commitment of your classified people, your administrators, and your professional teachers. There's just no way you're going to make a difference. So having everybody unhappy in an organization, there's never been uh, an unhappy army that won a war, right? And, and you, you've got a war to fight. And so bringing everybody along is going to take some time and you're going to need more than one dose of a lot of this stuff. This is, I covered a lot of stuff tonight. Um, I would hope that it would take another round or two to really get it. Right. So I, I would start right down that trail and, and just keep making the circle bigger. And when you've got the board, you've got the superintendent and the cabinet, you've got the uh, stakeholders internal to the district, then I'd make that circle bigger and go out to the external stakeholders. But I think you have to, uh, you have to start them all, and they're all going to take some time. Uh, but if you don't have the inner piece figured out first, it's going to be really hard to have that conversation outside. Okay, thank you. That's my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. You had um, we we had. I just had a couple of uh, uh, questions for you. Um, we are uh, in that eighty percent band, as you mentioned, in terms of uh, uh, the potential for getting uh, additional concentration or the maximum amount of concentration. Uh, but uh, have you heard any clarity regarding uh, the provision two? And the, uh, uh, the the need to uh, identify every uh, eligible student, uh, whether that is a uh, if if that's a uh, hard and fast rule or not. I understand there's some controversy around that, and I wondered if you had any clarification for us. So that's one of the areas that we say is not clear, and that the state board regulations need to clarify. And uh, you could read that section four times and come up with four different answers. And so uh, moving on any of those answers subjects your district to some risk. And so um, we think you're doing what you're doing for this year, and that's what you do. And then uh, in the spring, you may find out that that won't work for any subsequent year and that you've got to do something different. Thank you. And uh, also, uh, when it, as you know, we're one of the core waiver districts in the state. And, um, you know, right now we're in the mix of AB 484, which is about the state test and the role of a student level assessment data. Is, uh, do you see any, um, any requirements in terms of the teacher evaluation system and the, uh, the linkages between uh, the, the state uh, assessment strategies and, uh, and uh, LCFF in so, terms of the LCAP? So I, I, you're being very charitable. You're assuming there are state strategies and that there is a linkage in somebody's mind between these two. And so I'm going to just leave that like that for a minute. Um, and, and let me just say that the testing in California, in my opinion, has been a problem. Um, I, uh, uh, my grandfather grew up on, uh, on a farm and ran a dairy farm in Wisconsin. And he told me one time, you know, uh, something about cows. Uh, you know, the cow doesn't gain weight just because I weigh it more often. And, and, and that's the way our testing has been, right? And, and so doing less testing and more teaching. Uh, when I was a deputy superintendent or superintendent, you know, I, I learned that uh, time on task with a highly qualified teacher is what improves student performance, not, not testing them all the time. And so, um, so my view is that the state has not come to grips with the testing at all. Um, they are committed to high stakes testing, uh, but here we are getting rid of a system that we've used for a long time. We did the same thing in the late 80s and early 90s, about the time that we might have had some longitudinal data that we could use to base our decisions on, we scrapped the system and started over. And, uh, and that's what we're doing again. So the, the testing is an ominous kind of a thing sitting out there. 
uh, that a lot of districts are starting to worry about. Uh, but I, I think that um, that's something the state does to you. The uh, LCAP is something that you do for you. So I'd worry more about the LCAP right now um, and mm -hmm. less about the testing right well, now. Well, the, the reason is, is because I appreciate you mentioning that the uh, nine elements of the LCAP, mm -hmm. and one of them uh, is increase the academic performance index for each school and for each numerically significant pupil subgroup and reduce gaps in the academic performance index and other measures of pupil achievement between numerically significant groups. So I'm just wondering if that is grounds for, you know, a um, some kind of, um, of uh, um, uh, restriction or, or uh, you know, take back. So that language is very similar to what we've had in the past uh -huh. uh, as to the testing standards that got to improve each subgroup and then overall improve. And over the last few years, um, the highest performing groups have done better. The lowest performing groups have also done better, but not as much better. And so the achievement gap has actually grown. And, and so I think that that provision gives you license in your LCAP when you're 80%. Again, my advice would be different if you were 10%. When you're 80%, I think your board gets to say, okay, our superintendent and staff has recommended these strategies to move those groups, and we can use the money in a lot broader forms than other districts can, and that's what we're gonna do. And I think your board can approve that. Um, I think that if I were in a district that had a very low number, I'd be saying, you've got to track those dollars, those subgroups, these dollars have to follow this group of kids, and you can't spend them as broadly. Uh, I had one uh, district ask me about uh, pay raises, and uh, uh, the board was saying uh, their strategy was it was a low-paying district, with low achievement and a lot of students that qualify. And so uh, their strategy was over time, we need to improve our teacher quality. So we're gonna put money into higher salaries. Uh, we're gonna put more money into lower class sizes. We're gonna put more money into staff development. We're gonna try to move up the teacher quality. And how does that work in a district like yours? And, and actually it works pretty well if that's your highest priority. Uh, because you're able to address the needs of nearly every student. You have a lot more flexibility than a district with a lower count. I know that I, I've given you long answers because although I've been over here a lot of times over a lot of years, I don't get to see you often enough and I try to, try to get a, as many licks in as I can when I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We okay. appreciate it. Uh, we're going to take public comment now, and then we're, get, we're moving on to the next item. But I want to thank you very much for coming out uh, okay. and sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our public speakers are Jim Mordecai, Ben Visnick. Okay, uh, Jim Mordecai, speaking as an individual, um, I, I applaud the idea that uh, um, we, d we don't uh, improve the cow by just weighing it and uh, in the testing view. Uh, RBB came up, and I have to point out the inaction of this board. Uh, RBB's been in place for all these years, and it's very simple. Yeah, the, the part of the formula was to test, uh, no, no, for, for students in schools that have low, uh, that, that their absence rates are bad. You're transferring money from schools where absence rates are good, and you've never touched that issue. So it, it's very disconcerting. Um, there was just so much went by, my mind's a, a muddle. Uh, so it, I think it's really uh, important um, and you will be struggling this in the to come, but we're still stuck with 46 in the nation. And when everything's said and done, too often uh, you 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 set goals which are, are not realistic in terms of the money we really have available. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Visnick. Good evening, uh, President Gorham is uh, sick, so I'll be substituting for her this evening, speaking on behalf of the OEA. And I would respectfully request, if we're going to be uh, partners, as Mr. Bennett suggested, that you give the uh, employee representatives more than, well, it's 43 seconds right now. Uh, I, I think we're going to hire Mr. Bennett uh, in CTA because 
on testing, prisons, 46, and especially on RBB, we have extreme agreement. And so I hope you're listening to him, particularly on the RBB piece. Now, there, I do, he did not mention that this district fa has failed all the, in the recent past to meet the 50% rule. So not only have we been underfunded, but the precious funds that we've had have not gone to the classroom. So we need to address that. Also, the disproportionate number of charter schools has taken resources from the district and we can't provide the programs in the real public schools that prevent parents from going to charters. So we're in a catch-22. So we Thank need you, Mr. to Visnick. cut the number of charters and we also need to look at what we can do this year with the 5%. I saw his figures. We do have 5% money Visnick. and I'll be coming back we'll, with we'll suggestions. We'll follow up with uh, President Gorham. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.